we do need women to come out and talk about their breasts more openly. In today's episode, we are focusing on all things metastatic breast cancer or better understood as advanced breast cancer. I am your host, Pauline. Welcome to TAW Real Chat, where life's insights are shared. TAW partners Pfizer to better understand this challenging topic of metastatic breast cancer. With me today are three doctors, Dr. Nora Fadlina, fondly known as Dr. Nina from University of Malaya Medical Center, Dr. Chong Kwang Jit from Makota Medical Center in Malacca, Dr. Lim Chun Sen, Sultan Ismail Hospital in Johor. What is metastatic breast cancer? I mean, metastatic is a huge word. When does breast cancer fall into the category of metastatic? Or advanced? Metastatic breast cancer is really when the cancer cells right from the breast has spread to other parts of the body. So usually metastatic breast cancer means um, the disease is not curable. And really the main aim is to control the patient's cancer. It is, I think, a devastating sort of news to receive as a woman to know not need that you have breast cancer, but suddenly it's an advanced stage of cancer. How do you break such devastating news to a patient usually? It is... Uh, such a difficult time uh, for patients. So I remember a lady to walk into my consultation room, but lo and behold, I had a 40-year-old man coming in when I called the patient's name. He was the, the patient's son. And basically he said, before you meet my mom, I want to tell you one thing. We're not discussing the word C with my mom. So the diagnosis will be withheld from the patient. I don't know whether Dr. Lim or Dr. Zhang have been in that position, but you, you do see relative who wants to protect the patient. Right. Dr. Definitely. Lim, have you had that? Yes, Dr. Zhang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very heard. common. Yeah, it's very common for you, Dr. Lim? If elderly came to the clinic and the young son or young daughter actually don't want doctors to disclose the diagnosis to them. And they actually inform everyone from the counter registration, blood taking site, do not tell the parents they're having cancer. Sometimes it's actually very difficult. I will tell mm. them, spend another 10 minutes to explain why they should know before we proceed. If patients don't understand their disease, how they actually cooperate and how they actually want to adhere to the treatment. Yeah, this is an, not an uncommon uh, situation. It happens quite often in yeah, Malaysia, is, certainly. Totally. Yes. Very much an Asian thing. I think when we call the scenario sort of breaking bad news, so to speak, it's important to check that the patient has family uh, or support close by that they want to have in the consultation room together right. and then ensure that it's uh, the right environment to break the news. Dr. Lim, when, when they hear that they have this diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer or stage 4 breast cancer, how do you help the patient to actually come to terms? How do you help them through that? Actually, very important is actually that the patient must understand what are they dealing with. Then we can actually discuss what treatment that available for them and to help them to go through stage by stage of the problem. Then patient understand their disease more, they can actually accept the treatment that we suggest to them. A lot of people, once actually they heard that I got breast cancer, and then they imagine maybe they saw their parents having mm. breast cancer last time, having chemo, so very toxic, very torturing process. They refuse to have treatment. But now the development of those actually anti-emetic or the chemo, non-toxic mm. like CDK46 inhibitor, all is actually very good. I would say reduce the side effect, but improve the quality of life. As clinicians, we try our hardest to get to know our patient. And, you know, you can't have one recipe that fits all in mm. terms of helping our patient true, true. accept their diagnosis. So I have a patient who's very young she's 35 and she's got a young child at home and you can imagine at that age have got lots of roles to play in terms of their career in terms of being a young mother mm. a young wife and sure. so suddenly being thrown with this hopeless a diagnosis in their eye can put a lot of conflict within themselves. So sometimes I would have to see them at multiple juncture before we can even go to let's discuss treatment options right. um, because I find that if we can't get through the barrier of acceptance, we do stumble every time throughout the sort of journey that we are together. And it is a, going to be a long journey as uh, Dr. Lim said, it becomes quite chronic, isn't it? So it's a long journey together. When you say a, a multi-juncture, what, what do you mean by that? Could you elaborate a little bit? There are certain things where some patients find it's acceptable and it's mm -hmm. a given, but certain things some patients find um, is not acceptable. That's all about tailoring 
uh, specific investigations or treatment to the patient in front of you. So for example, a patient that I saw needed an MRI scan. To her, the tunnel and the noise and an MRI scan was not something she was willing to put herself through. So these are all sort of the arts of medicine, so to speak, and just to really know your patients uh, and then come to a shared decision-making process together. I, I 100% concur with Nina because every cancer is unique. So we have to tailor-made our approach to that particular patient, especially when it comes to breaking bad news. Mm. I think we cannot just tell somebody, ah, your cancer is advanced stage, not curable, and stop there. You can't do that. You yep. have to then continue to say that, yes, it's not curable theoretically, but along every part of your journey subsequently, we are here to support you. Of course, besides the medical treatment, the mm. patient also will require emotional support, sometimes financial support, sometimes spiritual support. So multiple supports. When you break a terrible news as mm. metastatic incurable cancer, you have to go hand in hand by providing patient hope and support even mm. if the disease is not curable. And I think that there, there is this fear in the community. In fact, we have a question from the TAW community and I quote the question, is stage 4 breast cancer an immediate death sentence? Definitely not because there are many factors actually determines the actual life expectancy of a patient with a stage 4 or metastatic breast cancer. Right. Basically, there are three factors. Mm -hmm. One is the patient factor. Is it a young patient? Is she a, an elderly patient? Is she fit or is she having any other medical conditions as well? Say, for example, an elderly lady also with diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. Mm -hmm. So this kind of patient life expectancy would not be so good. Another factor is the cancer factor. Mm -hmm. Breast cancer has got many different subtypes. Some are mm -hmm. truly bad, maybe with life expectancy of a few days or a few weeks. Mm -hmm. But many, many of them can still go on for years. Another factor is the treatment factor. If the patient refuses treatment or goes on some kind of alternative treatment, not the ideal treatment, not appropriate treatment, so the disease is not controlled, Obviously, the, the life expectancy will be low. Whereas mm. if you give the patient the appropriate, the right treatment promptly, normally you can control the cancer for years. Right. So you're saying that there are three factors. If I hear you right, Dr. Chong, you have yes. the patient factor, cancer factor, and treatment factor. Yes, definitely. For me, I mean, metastatic cancer is not a death sentence to everyone. For me, I think now that the development of the drug, the cancer now is actually go to the stage like chronic diseases, mm -hmm. uh, especially for breast cancer, hormone positive or HER2 positive disease. And it's actually patient now live more than five years. It's actually, we can see a lot. A lot of people equate cancer as death penalty. It is not. Most early cancers are already curable by today's treatment uh, uh, methods. Mm. And with treatment, the patient can still go on with good quality life for years. The patient can still own her life. Yes, own your life. Hashtag own your life, guys. And the thing is, you know, a lot of these Korean dramas and Taiwanese dramas, you know, when they show the uh, actress or you're know, having some sort of cancer, they are, it's very dramatic and they're suffering a, a huge lot. As Dr. Lim said, people have preconceptions from their relatives who had cancer previously and, and the treatments that they went through. Is it true that patients with metastatic breast cancer are able to actually engage in a normal life, so to speak, or, or that's not the case? If I might share, um, mm. a story of, uh, of a patient that we're still caring for. Uh, she's in her late 30s. She has a music school. She's a piano teacher. The cancer has spread 
to her bones, her lungs and her liver. And she only got to know about it because she was breastfeeding her second child. And she realized that her nipple uh, on one side was inverted or stuck in. Yep. And then she went and, and had further investigation. So you can imagine how devastating it was mm. for her still fitting into a role as a mother and then having to face this diagnosis. She has a very supportive husband. And the great news is um, the advancement in medical care at the moment is enabling her two and a half years down the line. She's still running her music school wow. without actually any chemotherapy at the moment. And she's taking pills so because she's got hormone positive breast cancer. So I think at the end of the day, it's a mixed bag of disease. We have to highlight these cases um, to our community to try and bust the myth that you've just mentioned of Korean drama of this lady just lying hopelessly in bed days on end because that's not true. My patient is teaching her piano to her students still. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Nina. Dr. Uh, I Nina, got one, yeah. another one case also actually. I got one teacher, 37 year old, is triple negative press CA. Since 2000, 2017, almost every year having chemo, he said she can contribute to the society, to the school, the education. Mm. She's actually willing to actually do. They're actually mm. pushing her live longer and further. Wow. So I'm hearing patient factor coming through a lot. Actually, can I just go back to you, Dr. Nina, because you mentioned about breastfeeding. Uh, we actually have a question from Jane from the TAW community as well. And she asks, can you still breastfeed even with metastatic breast cancer? I've not had patients who are breastfeeding on treatment. I think it really depends on where you are in the journey of your breast cancer so and the type of breast cancer you have and the type of treatment. At the end of the day, it, it depends if your milk supply is still there uh, for you to breastfeed. If the treatment doesn't interfere with it, because clearly if you are uh, undergoing chemotherapy, then that's something that we wouldn't advise. Right. Yeah, this is rather uncommon. I think by and large, the uh, breastfeeding would be stopped because... If the patient is on chemotherapy or hormonal therapy, if the baby were to drink the breast milk, perhaps there might be some effect on the baby. So I don't think that would be a good thing to do. Thank you. Thank you for answering Jane there. So what I'm hearing is some misconceptions or, or misbusting things, you know, as Dr. Nina mentioned. When I came to this talk, I thought that we would be you know, speaking a lot about uh, el more elderly women in advanced breast cancer. But what I'm hearing from the three of you is that you are seeing patients that are quite young in advanced breast cancer as well. So that's something that, that I wasn't expecting. The truth is in Malaysia, sort of there's some work uh, that's been done in UM. The uh, peak incidence of breast cancer is much younger when you compare it to the Western population. Over here, we see the peak is probably 40 to 50 years old compared to the you know Western population at 60, 70 years old. So so, um, you know, that, that's, that's what we're seeing in clinic. What, what are the other common misconceptions, do you think? I mean, today is the perfect time to, to really bust all those myths and preconceptions. Anyone here? Actually, chemotherapy has been used for, for a long time. It's still the workhorse. Mm -hmm. But even for chemotherapy, you can come also in the form of tablets, not necessarily intravenously. With tablets... Sometimes the patient can tolerate the treatment very well without all these horrible uh, you know, side effects of chemotherapy that one tend to associate chemotherapy with, mm -hmm. such as hair loss, nausea, vomiting, totally flat mm -hmm. out like the Korean drama. Not mm -hmm. necessary. There are patients right. on oral mm -hmm. chemotherapies going on for a long time and still having good quality life. So mm -hmm. even chemotherapy may not be as bad as what we always assume. We actually have a question from another member of the TAW community, Grace. She submitted a video question. And let me play it for us all. Hey, the Asia woman. So I have a question for a woman who has breast cancer. What are the next steps that she can do to determine if the uh, cancer is actually metatastic? So I think what she's saying is if someone's discovered their uh, breast cancer, how is the woman then to know that it's actually metastatic? Whether it's cancer or any other illnesses, normally we take a history. Mm -hmm. We find out from patient, what are your symptoms? Yeah, mm -hmm. of course, breast lump, breast cancer. 
But mm. if the patient were to tell me I have, say, for example, cough, 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 shortness of breath for more than a month or two months, I would start worry. Has the cancer gone to the lungs? For example, right. if the patient says I'm getting headache, nausea, vomiting all the time for the last few weeks, I worry whether the cancer has gone to the brain. So mm. by talking to the patient, you get some idea whether the cancer has spread or not. The other thing is you then examine the patient. If you feel the, say for example, if you feel the patient's abdomen and you feel hey, the liver is enlarged, perhaps mm. the cancer has gone to the liver. Mm. And then subsequently, as for any other conditions besides cancer, we may want to do some imaging, some x-ray, some scans. Sometimes right. you need different kinds of scans. Let's say PET scan, for example, that can tell you whether the cancer has gone to the bones, gone to the lung, gone to the liver, etc. You may need an MRI to see the brain, whether it has gone to the brain or not. Mm, very comprehensive. So history, physical examination, followed by investigative screening. And in terms of the breast cancer, when, when it actually spreads to become um, advanced breast cancer, what are the common areas that it sort of spreads to, Dr. Nina? I quite like the term seed and soil hypothesis, which is what we go back to. So if you want to plant Haromanis mangoes, right? Yep. So you need to find the right soil for that seed to grow. So the same mm. thing as breast cancer. The cell goes around your body and they find specific areas or organs where it can then grow more. So it doesn't mean that it goes to, you know, every single organ in your body, but it does like specific areas that are your lymph nodes or lymph glands. So that those are the chains. And then they do like to go to your lungs, uh, bones, um, and liver, sometimes brain. Let's let's go through one by one of them because I imagine the symptoms when it, you know, it spreads to different areas of the body will be quite different. I mean, I think Dr. Chong touched on that briefly earlier. Let, let's start with the bone. What sort of symptoms uh, would that be, um, Dr. Lim? The disease goes to the bone. Most mm -hmm. of the time, patients may come with bone pain. They may actually complain of unable to sleep or numb. Or sometimes the both lower limb is actually weak to work because soft like damage the spinal cord that making them unable to function. So mm -hmm. many, many patients actually complain of pain. Right. Um, so if pain is a symptom for, for having the spread to the bone, how about the lung, um, Dr. Chong? At early stage, of the spread to the lung, you have no symptoms whatsoever. Oh, no warning. You can't see it. Patient doesn't feel anything. Right. You only detect it when you do an X-ray or CT scan or PET scan. You see spots in the lung. Right. But if they are enough spread to the lungs, normally the common symptoms would be cough. If somebody with breast cancer complains of persistent cough for more than two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, getting worse with or without blood. Right. So that could be a sign of spreading to the lungs. If further getting worse or more, the patient will develop shortness of breath. Initially, on exertion. But subsequently, if again, more lungs are affected, shortness of breath can even happen at rest. And Dr. Nina, you mentioned just now that spread to the limb glands. Would there be some sort of symptoms for that? Yeah, so, um, you know, sometimes when you're small or when your child has glandular fever and you get swollen limb glands in your neck, by the same concept, if uh, a woman with advanced breast cancer might get swollen lymph glands uh, underneath your armpits, around your neck, or mm -hmm. even far away, for example, in, in the groins. What I tell my patients is that be, be body aware, own your life and be body aware, right? Always sort of be checking. And, and if there are any abnormalities that's persistent, then that's mm -hmm. something that we need to investigate further. Um, let's touch very quickly about the brain and the liver. Dr. Lim, do you want to enlighten us on what the symptoms might be? For, for the brain, sometimes actually the, the symptom can be very subtle, like a bit giddy. So patient actually unable to express what is a discomfort. And sometimes they actually come with very severe headache. Worst scenario is actually come with the stroke conditions. The mass is actually big and causing like left-sided or right-sided body unable to function. Mm -hmm. And if the brain is involved over the cerebellum, then patient may be having giddiness or unable to walk properly. So it depends on actually where is the location. I, I got one patient actually, the family member keep telling me the patient actually unable to actually convey a right message. Talk to me in this, but like, 
another message to me. They feel that actually the patient behavior is a bit wrong, but patients actually well can talk, can jog, can eat, can sleep well. I did the MRI. Oh, found there's actually a small brain lesion over the temporal loop for for the liver. So so it's like what Dr. Chong just now explained. Sometimes actually the liver lesion is actually very small, subtle, and we can't pick up. We have to actually use all the imaging like ultrasound, CT scan to actually identify this actually a liver uh, metastatic. And unless the lesion is actually very big, causing liver enzyme is raised, then doctors sometimes may actually advise the patient to have imaging earlier. Then the mm-hmm. time we may pick up a big liver lesion. Seldom liver lesion they causing pain unless the liver lesion is actually near to the edge and causing the capsule being extended and causing pain or discomfort to patient. Perhaps I can just add a little bit more. Sure, of course. When the when the the spread in the liver is very extensive, patients often complain of loss of appetite loss of weight. Sometimes they also complain of pain just below the right rib cage, you know, the upper side of the abdomen because the liver is enlarged. And another scenario that actually liver may be picked up late is actually the causing the biliary duct that actually obstructed that patient come to the clinic with jaundice or right. co- complaining the urine is actually too dark color. Then mm. the time we might worry and we have to do the liver checking on uh, to, to confirm what is the cause of the liver relinge. Sometimes the abdomen is distended because the liver fails to function and there are fluid accumulation in the abdomen. But mm. all these are very advanced liver involvement. Yeah. Right, right. Is there an organ or particular area that when you have advanced breast cancer and it spreads, it's, it's more likely to spread to a particular area than, than the others that have been discussed today? The bones are the commonest site of spread. And anyway. another site that we, we, we didn't discuss is actually the skin. In, in government hospital, we see a lot of patients that come late, presented with ulcer. The worst scenario is actually the cancer infiltrate through the skin from the breast until the lower part of the breast or maybe posterior part of the body. To take care of the wound is actually very difficult. And second thing, patients will be in pain. Sometimes this ulcer causing bleeding, so it's actually very difficult to deal and appearance. Because with the wound ulcer, the smell come out, you also make you fear to meet people and you actually, sometimes the ulcer is actually too big, too heavy for you to move around. And another condition that the, the skin lesion may cause your limb actually being swollen, what we call it lymph edema. And lymph edema, sometimes I saw patient so heavy, the limb is actually causing dislocate. The limb is totally cannot function at all. For, for me, this is actually another uh, very bad problem. Adding to this, the silver lining of spread to the skin is that even at very early stage, you can see it. Because it's on the surface, on the skin. By right, if you detect it early and you seek treatment early, a small spray on the skin is easy to treat. This is actually all patient factor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they actually maybe go and see BOMO traditional mm-hmm. medicine. So delay the treatment to come see um, oncologist. Yeah, I think um, I have to chip in on this that sure. um, the, the main issue here is late presentation and and that's what we see uh, quite a lot in clinic. Um, When I was 18 years old, I was hanging out with my really good friend and her mom is this modern mother who was driving us everywhere, the hippest mom I know. And she was hiding a fungating breast cancer. She didn't tell anyone in her family. And I went to her funeral, just bawling my eyes out, thinking, how uh, is it that a modern woman like her would feel that it's a social stigma within our society to talk about breast cancer? So Pauline, I congratulate you on this program because we do need women to come out and talk about their breasts more openly. So people don't tell each other, hey, I've just had my my mammogram done. People Mm. don't talk about that openly and we need to be able to do that. Definitely, definitely. So, so this stigma is real, I think, in, in the community, especially um, for women in, in breast. Are there any other sort of reasons that you think why um, patients are presenting late? Because all these are, are, are terrible things to be experiencing, but if presented early, something could be done to help. What could be some of the other reasons that you have observed in your practice? Sometimes I would say that the cancer was detected early, but the patient went the wrong path 
as far as the treatment is concerned, patient could have opted for some alternative treatment, traditional treatment, non-scientific treatment that doesn't work. So when it came right. to us, you ask them, oh, how long have you been having this swelling in your breast? One year or two years, I said, oh, goodness me. So sometimes mm. they've already gone to a hospital one year ago and confirmed to have cancer, diagnosed cancer, and advised to have appropriate treatment. But the patient mm. refused. The patient defaulted. And the patient went her own way. We are not talking mm. about something growing inside that you can't see, you know. Something that you can see, you can smell. <laughs> even at a distance. I absolutely concur. This is what I see. Patients go for alternative traditional treatment. If you compare sort of life expectancy, women in Malaysia are doing much worse in comparison to other uh, neighboring countries. Take Singapore, for example, about uh, 60 to 70 percent are living at five years compared to in Singapore, it's 80 to 90 percent. How mm. can we uh, bridge this gap? I feel if we go against, then we are at a losing end. What we need to say is think about having a tandem treatment. So I tell my patients openly, if you are thinking that, mm -hmm. you know, my treatment options are not good enough because I can't claim what's been claimed out there. Why don't we do this in tandem? Mm -hmm. Don't default my treatment. Let's let's do this together. And the thing is, right, it's, it's terribly stressful for the patient. You have all sorts of information, unsolicited advice from everyone. What are some tips that you could share with patients, Dr. Nina, on how to cope with this stress? Oh, we do know that patients who are going through treatment, um, patients with good social support, psychological support, good net network uh, of mm -hmm. people around them with positive attitude do much better in terms of less side effect and better quality of life. So I think at the end of the day, we all have to empower each other. We do have a lot of NGOs and organizations within our community, women who can empower each other, who are going through treatment. So we get stronger together. So I think the most important thing is to break that barrier and to reach out and to form that support with the people around you. Because I think women do feel very isolated and feel that they have to get through this on their own. I, I love what you just said, you know, the idea of getting being stronger together, empowering one another. I mean, Dr. Nina has talked a little bit about, you know, not doing it alone. Don't be isolated. Reach out to somebody. Dr. Chong, what are some ways that they can actually help themselves as well? The way I look at it, the most important thing is seek professional help. Mm. Because the moment you have detour from the appropriate help, you are already into the rabbit hole. And the moment you are in the rabbit hole, you will continue to go down further and further until you hit the wall. Then only you realize, oh, it's, I hit the wall. It's dead end. I turn back. By the mm -hmm. time you turn back, you have lost the golden opportunity most of the time. So the, from the very beginning, it's the most important thing. Make the right decision. Seek mm. professional help. For example, see the right doctor. Mm. Advise the appropriate treatment promptly. Mm. Not appropriate treatment at the last minute. Too late. You miss mm. the boat. And there's no second chance. Mm. Bear in mind, a cancer from stage one will progress to stage two if mm. left untreated. Then stage three. Then stage four. It will not go reverse. Once it reaches stage four, despite the best treatment, it will not mm. go reverse. So mm. very, from very beginning, seek professional help. Let's say the patient comes to see me. With, you know, I advise the patient, you will need surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, mm -hmm. hormonal therapy, or targeted therapy, or immunotherapy. If at the same time, the patient has a lot of stress, emotional turmoil, needs psychological or psychiatric help, we can also refer to the appropriate professional, a psychologist, mm -hmm. a psychiatrist. If the patient needs a nutritional support, I can refer to a, a dietitian or nutritionist. Right. And if the patient needs emotional support, perhaps I can direct the patient to join our patient support groups. You see, the whole ecosystem is available with the professionals. Important thing is go on the right path <laughs> and then you can own your life. Yes. I, I see Dr. Lim smiling away. Dr. Lim, you have anything to add there on how patients can help themselves? I, I totally agree with what Dr. Nina and Dr. Chong's uh, view. I, I think professional is actually one of the important 
uh, part, find the right doctors, find out what is their problem. Subsequently, mm. the social support that come in and when the professional team that advise actually will bring all the teamwork like uh, MDT discussion, breast surgeon mm. come in, dietitian, all come in ready. On patient part, they have to actually be active exercise, share what they fear for, then mm. to get the, all the support. Right. And Dr. Nina, before, just before you mentioned also the, um, that there are lots of NGOs out there with information as well. I mean, patients are seeking information. Um, they're reading on the internet. Are there sources that you would recommend your patients to go to in terms of information seeking? We do have recommendations. But at the end of the day, I think if you discuss what you've read uh, mm. in your own research with your healthcare professional, having that trusting relationship with your doctor, then hopefully they can steer you or nudge you in the direction that you want. So um, there are certain um, generic websites that I usually point my patients to in terms of uh, Macmillan Breast Cancer. Um, Cancer Research Malaysia is coming up with sort of patient uh, guidance in terms of how to make decision in uh, breast cancer therapy. At the end of the day, what I see my patients get most information from is from their peer, from their group, from that conversations mm. that they have between each other. And again, just touching on, you know, how can patient get through this moment? Sometimes in the chaos, you do have to find your goal, your aim. What are you here for? I really like that book called Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. He's a surgeon, American surgeon, and he that book has informed me as a physician how to steer patients in this really meaningful part of their life. How do you live your life to the last with autonomy, dignity, and joy, right? At the mm. every single moment. Here at Real Chats, we're in an episode on 30th of September where three breast cancer doctors from Penang helpfully explain the different types of breast cancer and um, the various treatment options available. Quick recap, we learned that there were three major groups, hormone positive, HER2 positive, and triple negative. The common public preconception is cancer equals treatment equals chemotherapy. But as we understand it, that's no longer the case today. There are lots of treatment options. Is that through as well for metastatic breast cancer? Are there options other than chemotherapy? Let's start with the first one, advanced hormone positive breast cancer. Dr. Dina, what sort of options are available today? It is actually an exciting time for hormone positive breast cancer. Wow. I think um, I wasn't born as an oncologist. Um, when I was sort of searching for the light or the answer, what should I do uh, mm. in my medical career? I went looking and finding how oncologists were so happy with two months increase in their life expectancy mm. of their patients. So I thought, why are we celebrating this? But now we are truly celebrating extensive prolongation of life with the treatments that we have, especially in hormone positive breast cancer. What we're seeing is we're coupling anti-hormone. So we talk about patients and we always say, these are your hormone treatments, but actually what it is, it's anti-hormone. So it's targeting those uh, hormone receptors. So right. we target those together with targeted therapy, then we can see a further improvement in a patient's life expectancy. And these are mostly by and large tablet treatments. So that's again, a, a massive win for the uh, advanced breast cancer community. They can take their pills at home and mm. sort of that minimizes hospital admissions, hospital visits, which can be pretty disruptive if you've got um, you know, family and lots of other things going on with your life. I feel that right now we have uh, a lot of options available, uh, especially in the hormone positive breast cancer. Nice. What about um, HER2 positive breast cancer? Uh, Dr. Lim, do you want to take that? HER2 breast cancer, now there's actually a more development uh, coming out. Everyone agreed with me that this ESCO 2021, there's actually a new breakthrough drug that treatment for patients. We can see the big advancement and achievement of overall survival for those actually treatment. So the main treatment for anti-HER2, I always tell patients, you have to select the right target for your HER2 so that the cell is actually not continue to stimulate or maybe making more other cancer cells that actually grow. And this is not a chemo, this is actually a protein that going to the body and stop 
progression of the disease, sort of like making the, the cell you no know, food supply, then it died by itself. Development of new treatment that changing a lot to patient and they, they want to live with quality of life. Wow, so it sounds like exciting time for uh, hormone positive and HER2 positive. How about triple negative, uh, Dr. Chung? Well, about 15% of breast cancer falls into this group called triple negative. Negative for estrogen, progesterone receptor, and HER2 receptor. So basically, triple means negative of these three factors. Mm -hmm. By and large, triple negative cancers tend to happen in younger ladies and normally much more aggressive. And as far as treatment is concerned, for decades, we've been using only chemotherapy. Mm. But in recent years, besides chemotherapy, there are other drugs. Like, for example, uh, if the patient contains something called BRCA mutation positive, Mm -hmm. we can use drugs like so-called PUP inhibitors, a kind of targeted therapy in Mm. the form of tablets. Besides chemo, Mm -hmm. besides targeted therapy, Mm -hmm. inhibitor, Mm -hmm. there is another possibility that we can use in the appropriate patients using immunotherapy in combination with chemotherapy. Now, we we talk about, you know, exciting time for hormone positive and HER2 positive and and things like that. And uh, new medicines are being developed. There is this term that's floating around in some conversations, clinical trials. Dr. Lim, what are clinical trials and, and what sort of role do they play in advanced breast cancer? In a simple word, it's actually a study that we are investigating on new product and to test whether it's actually safe and it's actually effective to be used. In Malaysia, actually, I think a lot of companies bring in a lot of clinical trial to be actually uh, help our own Malaysian patients to have the better treatment with lower toxicity and improved quality of life. Dr. Nina, do you have anything to add on this topic of clinical trials? No, I'm a big champion of clinical trials. We need to get involved in clinical trial to then advance medical knowledge and hopefully provide our patients and women out there with the best treatment options available. So um, clinical trial doesn't just mean um, looking at investigational drugs, but it can also mean looking at uh, intervention. So I'm currently running digital health intervention. So looking at uh, breast cancer patients using mobile app, uh, doing digital health intervention to see how that can improve their quality of life. A lot of my patients are very enthusiastic about clinical trials because they feel they can give back to their community. And truthfully, they do get um, more monitoring, more follow-up, which is only uh, a good thing for the patients. With clinical trials, it's still at a developmental phase, isn't it? So do you find that patients are a bit more apprehensive uh, to join the clinical trial or right. generally they're quite open to it? We must remember that clinical trials are done in strictest standards, international standards, and they go through rigorous ethic board approval, multi-layer of approval prior to being able um, to then invite our patients. And the first thing that we as clinicians do not want to do is we do not want to cause harm to our patients. So prior to that drug being available, we actually test them on multiple layers. So there are lots of different phases of clinical trials before we then say, yes, um, we can then test it to to see whether it makes a a difference or not. Actually, patients are not um, so apprehensive about it. They are pretty open. That's my experience anyway. In in my center, actually, I did quite a number of clinical trials. So sometimes the patient is actually hesitant whether they want to join. Then we have to actually explain to them their safety is actually ensure. Second thing, we have to tell them, yeah, you maybe you label yourself as a guinea pig, but you are actually high-end guinea pig that doctors will actually ensure, monitor every week or maybe every month with serial imaging and the blood test to ensure you are, your disease is well controlled and your safety being uh, ensured. That's on clinical trials. I want to touch on one more topic, genetic testing. Dr. Chong, what's your view on genetic testing? Can you explain to our audience what is it? So it has got two usage. One, to predict the risk of getting cancer. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to help us to use, to select which patient for a specialized drug that only targets this defective gene. 
basically genetic testing is is you do a test to see whether let's say a patient already having breast cancer mm-hmm. if he were to do a genetic test we want to do normally what we call a BRCA test BRCA test that test will tell us whether that patient has inherited a defective gene in her body that predisposes her to getting cancer and if she has the genetic uh, defect, the BRCA gene, perhaps her siblings, her children could also have inherited the same defective gene and mm-hmm. they too will be predisposed to getting cancer. That's mm-hmm. number one. Yep. Number two, besides knowing the risk of developing or getting cancer, mm-hmm. if we were to know that somebody harbors this BRCA gene, harbors yeah. this mutated gene, Mm-hmm. There is a treatment for that particular type of cancer. Right. So basically help us to decide whether or not to use one particular drug. Dr. Lim, do you use uh, genetic testing a lot in your practice? In Malaysia, there's actually two methods to actually do. We can actually normally, we have to send the normal tissue. I actually wouldn't actually send the tumor for the test because mm-hmm. I'm actually more concerned about the genetic hereditary. So I will actually take either saliva or the blood mm-hmm. for the further testing on that. But but before all this testing, I think the, the patients or the family member must understand what they are testing for. I think the counseling is actually very important because there's actually a lot of implication to them, not only to the patient, but to the family members. If there's actually a young patients, then probably they may have their also other sibling may have inherited this gene problem. Mm-hmm. So if actually they have this, we will have to ask their permission to to discuss the result to other siblings so that, that if they are actually a carrier, so other siblings that might have the same problem, then we have to advise them to have mm-hmm. early prevention treatment, okay, mm-hmm. such as mastectomy or maybe mm-hmm. ophrectomy, taking out the ovary to mm-hmm. actually prevent all this cancer development. And to their children mm-hmm. also, we have to actually educate them or tell them at what age. Normally, we advise at age of 21 for further mm-hmm. testing or on this gene carrier. Mm-hmm. But the problem with the children if their mothers are carrier mm-hmm. and at the moment Malaysia insurance actually don't have any problem with that but we don't know what the future be but the children if actually they are carrier then mm-hmm. we worry that actually insurance is actually a big problem in future I think that's really useful to know well, I will counsel those patients that actually below 50 year old to have all this uh, gene uh, testing and in triple negative breast cancer mm-hmm. about 20% of such patients patients may harbor BRCA mutation, may harbor mm-hmm. this mutated gene. Whereas right. if you just take breast cancer as a whole, mm-hmm. perhaps only about 5 or 10% the most having this mutated gene. But in triple negative, about 20%. So in patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we would normally encourage the patient to test for BRCA gene to see whether the patient has this gene or not. If the patient has, perhaps a drug called PUP inhibitors could be useful for that particular patient. Well, before we wrap, there is another question we have from the TAW community and it's from Elaine. I quote, how does having reached or not reached menopause affect my treatment options? Any takers here? I think just now we talk about hormonal therapy. Mm. Pauline, you also mentioned there are three types of breast cancer, broadly speaking. One of them is hormonal receptor positive. When we are giving hormonal treatment, we actually mean we are giving anti-hormone treatment. And for certain anti-hormone drugs, they they are only appropriate or work best if the patient is post-menopausal. So we want to know the menopausal status of the patient. If the patient is still menstruating, the the drugs are different from the drugs used for post-menopausal menopausal women Mm. so so it's important sometimes sometimes in order to use certain drugs in fact most of the good drugs for hormonal positive breast cancer we need to convert somebody who's still menstruating into stopping menses right some sometimes we artificially induce menopause in order to allow us to use the drug that we want to use which works very well in a post-menopausal women that's the reason we want to know if the patient is menstruating or already menopausal. I see. And 
you know, um, before we come to an end, I must ask that million dollar question. How can women actually reduce the risk of having advanced breast cancer? I think this is a really popular one that um, our, our audience usually would like to ask. Number one, if possible, reduce your risk of getting breast cancer. Because if you don't get breast cancer, you won't get advanced breast cancer. But there's no foolproof way, unfortunately, to prevent breast cancer. There are certain things that one can do. For example, maintain an optimal weight. Act right. physical exercise, breastfeeding, don't drink alcohol or reduce whatever alcohol that you're drinking. Mm. And if you're postmenopausal, avoid hormonal therapy. Means mm. taking hormone, taking female hormone. All this can to some degree reduce one's risk of getting breast cancer. And if unfortunately one must get breast cancer, hopefully one goes for a early screening so that the disease can be detected early. If the disease is detected early, of course the next step will be prompt appropriate treatment. Sure. So that the early breast cancer could be treated and cured no mm. chance to develop into advanced, advanced breast, breast cancer. cancer. Right, right. I think I, I completely agree with Dr. Chong. One thing that I would highlight is screening, screening, screening. So women, you know, as you're aging, uh, when you hit the age of 40 and above, just really think about looking after yourself. So go for a mammogram ultrasound once every three years. And when you do it, tell people you've done it so that you empower each other and your friends so that they can do it. So lots of people shy away from this, even my own, you know, relatives. And they're like, ah, mammogram, my breast is going to be pressed. It's going to be painful. You know, actually, it's slightly uncomfortable, but, you know, it gives you wealth of information. Um, and be body aware is another thing, because sometimes you can't help it. You've probably got early breast cancer and then you're on follow up. So that's um, another area where you got to be body aware and discuss with your oncologist or your treating physicians in terms of uh, new changes in your body uh, so that your doctor can detect things earlier. Mm. Um, I know this is, is something that we covered in our episode on 10 things you must know about breast cancer. And today we're focusing on advanced breast cancer, but I think we can never say this enough about screening, isn't it? And I want to ask you just so that we can emphasize, when does, should a woman do an ultrasound versus a mammogram um, in terms of screening, Dr. Nina? I've just hit 40 and I've gone for my mammogram and they told me that my breasts are dense. So young, uh, young women have a dense breast and they can't really detect very much on mammogram. And so I had an ultrasound on top of the mammogram to review things. So uh, really young women are mostly um, are investigated by ultrasound and MRI and then older women sort of postmenopausal by a mammogram. But it really depends on the center that's, that's doing it for you. Right. Thank you for that. Any last words, anyone? Dr. Lim, any last words? Be beside the mammogram and then an ultrasound, one thing that actually women can do is actually uh, breast cell examination, which is actually very important. And I, I think this one you can check every month after 10 days of menses. If you notice any lump, you can actually straight away go and see your family doctors or breast surgeon immediately rather than actually wait for another six months or, or one year of appointment to see a doctor. Besides those things that we mentioned, early detection saves life. Actually, not only saving lives, early detection with early prompt treatment mm -hmm. save your body. Do you know why? If the tumor is small, the surgeon could just remove the growth mm -hmm. without sacrificing the whole breast. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the cancer is very huge, unfortunately, the surgeon perhaps had to sacrifice the whole breast. Mm -hmm. So early detection and early prompt treatment saves lives save your body, mm -hmm. save a lot of money as well because <laughs> you do need a lot of treatments mm -hmm. because advanced stage, unfortunately, may require a lot of treatment continuously. Right. So that also entails a lot of money, a lot of time traveling to hospital. So early treatment, avoid all this trouble. Mm -hmm. So early detection and prompt early treatment matters tremendously and you can truly with that own your lives. Wow. 
well said and well put together, Dr. Chong. So everyone, you've heard that. In conclusion, early detection saves lives. Uh, get yourself self-examined, as Dr. Lim said, monthly, 10, 10 days after your period. As Dr. Nina said, do your screening and tell your friends when you do your screening. So let's have that conversation about owning our lives and, and doing our screenings. With all the insights today on advanced breast cancer, as hard as it is, there is hope. And we know that it is possible to hashtag own your life. If you like this episode, give us the thumbs up and share today's video with your loved ones and friends. See you at our next Real Chats episode. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.